signed to its place at 24 Calvert Street, Penn. The murdered woman was a Mrs. Maureen Lyon. In connection with the murder, the police are anxious to interview a man seen in the vicinity wearing a dark overcoat, light scarf, and soft felt hat. Motorists are warned against icebound roads. The heavy snow is expected to continue, and throughout the country there will be a sudden creep, particularly there at points on the north and northeast coast of Scotland. Giles. Molly? snowed up tomorrow. Oh dear, I do hope not. If only our pipes don't freeze. <laughs> we shall have to keep the central heating well stoked up. Oh dear, that is not good. I do hope they send the coke along. We've not got any too much. I do so want everything to go well at first. First impressions are so important. Well, is everything ready? Uh, nobody's arrived yet, I suppose. Well, no, thank goodness. I think everything's in order. Mrs. Barlow's hooked it early. Mm. Afraid of the weather, I suppose. What a nuisance these daily women are. That leaves all the work on your shoulders. And yours. This is a partnership. Just so long as you don't ask me to cook. <laughs> oh, no. That's my department. And anyway, we've got plenty of tins in case we are snowed up. And Giles, do you think it'll be all right? Got cold feet, have you? Are you sorry now that we didn't sell the place when your aunt left it to you, instead of having this mad idea of running it as a guest house? No, I don't. I love it. Oh, and talking of a guest house, just look at that. Oh, quite good, what? It's a disaster. Oh. Don't you see? You left out the S. It's Monkwell instead of Monkswell. Good Lord, so I did. How did I come to do that? <laughs> well, it doesn't matter, does it? I mean, Monkwell is just as good a name. You're in disgrace. Go and stoke up the central eating. Well, across that icy yard. Ugh. 
Shall I bank it up for the night now? But no, no, you don't do that till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. How appalling. <laughs> don't hurry up. Someone might arrive at any minute. Have you all the rooms arranged? Uh, yes, I think so. It's uh, Mrs. Boyle in the front four poster, Major Metcalf in the blue room, Miss Casewell in the east room, and Mr. Wren in the oak room. I do wonder what all these people will be like. Oughtn't we to have gotten rent in advance? No, I don't think so. Well, we are rather mugs at this game. They have luggage. If they don't pay, we'll hang on to their luggage. It's that simple. <laughs> I can't help feeling that we ought to have taken a correspondence course in hotel keeping. We are bound to get had in some way. And why? Their luggage may just be bricks wrapped in newspapers, and where will we be then? We all wrote from very good addresses. That is what servants with forged references do. <laughs> Why, they might be criminals hiding from the police. I don't care what they are, so long as they pay us seven fees <coughs> every week. <laughs> you are a wonderful woman of business, Molly. <laughs> terrifically grim and misabish. The entire place would simply be crammed with Penair's brass. Instead, it's heavenly, heavenly, quite heavenly, lovely proportion. That's fake. Oh, <laughs> this table's genuine. I'm simply going to love it here. Do you have any wax flowers or, or birds of paradise? I'm afraid not. Oh, what a pity. What about a sideboard? A purple, plummy, mahogany sideboard with great <laughs> solid and fruits carved on it. Yes, we have. In the dining room. In here? I must see it. children of assorted ages. <laughs> a grim governess in something called poor Herod, whose poor relation acts at General Stahn's body, is very, very grateful for being given a good home. <clears throat> I shall take your suitcase up to, upstairs to your room. The oak room, did you say? Yes. I do hope as a four-poster of little chintz roses. <laughs> it hasn't. <laughs> I don't think your husband's going to like me very much. How long have you been married? Are you very much in love? <laughs> We've been married just a year. 
Perhaps you'd like to come up and see your room. Tick tock. But I do so like knowing all about people. I think people are madly interesting. Don't you agree? Well, I suppose some are. <laughs> some are not. <coughs> no, no, I disagree. I think they're all interesting. Because you never really know what somebody is like or what they're really thinking. For instance, you don't know what I'm thinking about now, do you? <laughs> not in the least. <laughs> A cigarette? No, thank you. The only people who really know what other people are like are artists. They don't know why they don't know why they know it. But if they're portrait painters, it comes out on the canvas. Are you a painter? No, I'm an architect. My parents baptized me Christopher in the hope I'd become an architect. Christopher Ray! <laughs> as good as halfway home. Well, of course, everybody laughs about it and makes jokes about St. Paul's. <laughs> Chris Wren's pre-bad masks may yet go down in history. I'm going to like it to you. I find your wife most sympathetic. Indeed. <laughs> and really, very beautiful. Oh, don't be absurd. Now, isn't that like an English woman? Compliments always embarrass them. European women take compliments as a matter of course. English women have all of their feminine spirits crushed out of them by their husbands. <laughs> 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 Do come up and see your room. Shall I? <laughs> Just a little <coughs> hot water boiler, please. Indoor staff. 
Just us. Indeed. I was told that this was a guest house in full running order. We're only just starting. Well, I should think a proper staff of servants would be essential before opening an establishment of this kind. <laughs> oh, I consider your advertisement most misleading. May I ask, am I your only guest, along with Major Men? No, there are several others. This weather. Why, a snowstorm. A blizzard. It's just so unfortunate. But well, we <laughs> couldn't very well foresee the weather. The north wind doth blow and it's shuffling snow. And what will the rabbit do then? Poor thing. <laughs> I absolutely adore nursery rhymes. They're always so tragic in the car. It's <laughs> <laughs> apprehension, but perhaps be better if you went elsewhere. I can still call the taxi to return. The roads are not yet blocked. We've had so many applications for rooms, we should be able to fill your space quite easily. In any case, are we raising our terms next month? I shall think of leaving without trying the place out. You needn't think <coughs> you can get it with me now. <laughs> Perhaps you'll take me to my room. <coughs> no, certainly, Mrs. Boyle. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't seem to be a robbery. 
I told you, sex maniac. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Casewell, Molly, my wife. How do you do? It's an awful night. Would you like to come up and see your room? There's hot water if you'd like a bath. You're right, I would. Yes. 
It's a rather small one, I'm afraid. Naturally, naturally. You have the other guests, sir, yes. Well, we just opened this place as a guest house today, so we're rather new at it. Charming, uh, charming. <coughs> Uh, have you been in college? Oh, that is of no consequence. I have locked the car securely. But perhaps you would like to bring it in? No, no. I can assure you on a night such as this, there will be no thieves abroad. And as for me, my wants are very simple. Grazie, signor. Yes, I have all that I need in this uh, little bag. <laughs> you thoroughly really warm yourself. Oh, grazie, signor. I'll see to your room. I'm afraid it's a rather cold one because it faces north, but all the others are occupied. You have a several guests then? Yes. We have uh, Major Metcalf and Mrs. Boyle, uh, Miss, Mrs. Casewell, and, oh, and a young man called Christopher Wren. And now you. Ah, yes. Uh, the unexpected guest, the guest you did not invite, uh, the guest who just arrived from nowhere out of the storm. It sounds quite dramatic, does it not? Who am I? You do not know. Where did I come from? You do not know. <laughs> Me, I am the man of mystery. <laughs> From now on, there will be no more arrivals and no departures either. By tomorrow, perhaps already, we are cut off from civilization. No butcher, no baker, no milkman, no postman, no daily papers, nobody and nothing but ourselves. It is admirable, admirable. My name, by the way, is Parvicini. Uh, and ours is Ralston. Mr. and Mrs. Ralston. And uh, this is Monkswell Manor Guest House, you said. Uh, good. <laughs> Monkswell Manor Guest House. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Coming. I'll give you a hand. What? A 
point. Good exercise. Must have good exercise. <laughs>
dear. It sounds too, too grim. What is it? A novel? Didn't know I was a writer, did you? Are you? Sorry to disappoint you. Actually, I'm not. <laughs> Young woman. 
I naturally have heard of Sir Christopher Wren, the architect who built St. Paul's. You young people seem to think you are the only educated people in the world. Uh, I meant this Wren. His name is Christopher. His parents called him that because they'd hoped he'd be an architect. And he is. Or nearly one. So it turned out all right. Sounds a fishy story to me. If I were you, I should check on his uh, credentials. What do you know about him? Just as much as I know about you, Mrs. Boyle, which is that you are both paying us seven guineas a week. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I really need to know, isn't it? And all that concerns me. It doesn't matter to me whether I like my guests or whether I don't. <laughs> you are young and inexperienced and should welcome advice from those more knowledgeable than yourself. <coughs> and what about this foreigner? Well, what about him? You weren't expecting him, were you? <laughs> to turn away a bona fide traveler is against the law, Mrs. Boyle. You should know that. Why do you say that? Weren't you a magistrate sitting on the bench, Mrs. Boyle? All I am saying is that this paparazzini, or whatever he calls himself, the world, dear lady, talking <laughs> the devil, and here he is. <laughs> I didn't hear you come in. No, I come in on tippy toe like this. <laughs> Nobody ever hears me if I don't want them to. I find it very amusing. <laughs> in now, there was I a believe I shall oh, go to the drawing room to write my letters. Perhaps <laughs> it's warmer there. Oh, but my charming hostess looks upset. What is it, dear lady? It's just everything is rather difficult because of the snow. Ah, yes, of the snow. It makes things very difficult, does it not? Or else it makes them easy. Yes, very easy. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. No, there's quite a lot that you don't know. For one thing, I don't think you know very much about running a guest a house. Uh, well, I dare say we don't. But we mean to make a go of it. Blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> Not such a very bad cook. Oh, no. You are without a doubt, an enchanting cook. Oh. May I give you a little word of warning, Mrs. Ralston? You and your husband must not be too trusting. Have you references with these guests of yours? Is that usual? I thought that people just, just came. Oh, no. It's advisable to know a little about the people who asleep under your roof. Take, for example, myself. I turn up saying my car overturned in a snow drift. What do you know of me? I may be a fugitive from justice, a thief, a robber, a madman, even a murderer. Oh. You see, and perhaps you know just as little of your other guests. Well, as far as Mrs. Boyle goes, she were it is far too cold. <laughs> <laughs> I shall write my letters in here. Mm. Allow me to poke at the fire for you. <coughs> Excuse me, Mrs. Ralston. Uh, yes. Is your husband out? The pipes of their downstairs cloakroom are frozen. Oh, dear. dear. <laughs> what an awful day. First the police and then the police, did you say? Uh, they run up. Just now. They're sending a sergeant up here. But I don't think he'll ever get here. I hope all the half stones and the price. Hello. <laughs> Is anything the matter? I hear the police are on their way here. Why? <laughs> no, they don't get here today. No. It trips why they must be five feet deep and the roads are all banked up. No, no one is getting up here today. Uh, pardon me, Miss Powell. Oh, you know what the stand will make if you pardon. Are 
you Mr. Ralston? Yes. Thank you, sir. Detective Sergeant Trotter, Berkshire Police. <laughs> Can I get these skis off and stow them somewhere? Uh, yes, now come round to the front door, I'll let you in. Thank you, sir. Sir, this is what we are paying our police force for. <laughs> Snow all over him, looking terribly hearty. <laughs> that man I won't believe it. Is a policeman, a policeman, scaly. <clears throat> this is Detective Sergeant Trotter. Good afternoon. You can't be a sergeant. <coughs> You're too young. Well, I'm not quite as young as I look, madam, but terribly hearty. <laughs> <laughs> we can stow your ski skis under the stairwell. This way. Mrs. Watson? Yes. Excuse me, but may I use your telephone? Of course, Major Metcalf. He's very attractive, isn't he? I've always had one of his No brains. You can tell them the Hello? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Mrs. Walston, this telephone is dead. Quite dead. It was working about a half hour ago. Mine's gone with the weight of the snow, I suppose. <laughs> so, we're cut off now. <laughs> Quite cut off. That's funny, isn't it? I don't see anything funny. No, indeed. Ah, uh, it's a private joke of my own. It's, the sleuth is returning. Now we can get to business. Mr. Ralston, Mrs. Ralston, do you wish to speak with us alone? If so, we can't use the library. It's not necessary, sir. It'll save time if everybody's present. If I might sit here, I beg your pardon. Thank you. protection, if you understand me. Police protection? Yes, it relates to the death of Mrs. Lyon, Mrs. Uh, Maureen Lyon of 24 Culver Street, London, West 2, who was murdered yesterday, the 15th instant. You may have heard or read about the case. Yes, I heard it over the wireless. The woman who was strangled. That's right, madam. Now, the first thing I want to know is if you were acquainted with this Mrs. Lyon. I had never heard of her. Well, you mayn't have known of her under the name of Lyon. Lyon wasn't her real name. She had a police record, and her fingerprints were on file, so we were able to identify her without difficulty. Her real name was Maureen Stanning. Her husband was a farmer, John Stanning who resided at Longridge Farm, not very far from here. Longridge Farm? Was that one of those children? Yes, the Longridge Farm case. Three children. That's right, miss. The Corrigans, two boys and a girl, brought before the court as in need of care and protection. A home was found for them with Mr. and Mrs. Stanning at Longridge Farm. One of the children subsequently died as a result of criminal neglect and persistent ill-treatment. The case made a bit of a sensation at the time. It was horrible. Yes. The Stannings were sentenced to terms of imprisonment. <coughs> Stanning died in prison. Mrs. Stanning served her sentence and was duly released. And yesterday, as I say, she was found strangled <coughs> at 24 Culver Street. Well, who did it? Oh, I'm coming to that, madam. A notebook was picked up near the scene of the crime. In that notebook was written two addresses. 
One was 24 Culver Street, and the other was Monkswell Manor. What? Yes, sir. That's why <coughs> Superintendent Hogman, on receiving this information from Scotland Yard, thought it imperative for me to come out here to find out whether you knew of any connection between this house or anyone in this house and the Long Ridge Farm case. But there's nothing, absolutely nothing. It, it must be a coincidence. Uh, Superintendent Hogman doesn't think it is a coincidence, sir. He'd have come himself if it had been in any way possible, but under the weather conditions and as I can ski, he sent me with instructions to get full particulars of everyone in the house to report back to him by telephone and to take what measures I thought fit to ensure the safety of the household. Safety? What kind of danger does he think we're in? Good Lord. He doesn't think that someone is going to be killed here? I don't want to frighten any of the ladies, sir. But frankly, yes. That is the idea. <laughs> but why? That's what I'm here to find out. Well, this is crazy. Yes, sir. It's because it's crazy that it's dangerous. Nonsense. I must say, it seems a bit far-fetched. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> is there something you haven't told us, Sergeant? Yes, Mrs. Ralston. In that notebook, below the two addresses, was written three blind mice. And on the dead woman's body was a paper with this is the first written on it. And below the words, a drawing of three little mice and a bar of music. The music was the tune of the nursery rhyme, Three Blind Mice. Well, you know how it goes. Three blind mice, three blind mice, see how they run. They all ran after the farmer's wife. Oh, it's horrible. You said there were three children and one died? Yes, the youngest, a boy of eleven. What became of the other two? Uh, the girl was adopted by someone. We haven't been able to trace her present whereabouts. The elder boy would now be about twenty-two. Uh, he deserted from the army and hasn't been heard of since. According to the army psychologist, he was definitely schizophrenic. <laughs> a bit queer in the head, that's to say. Uh, they think it was he who killed Mrs. Lyon, or Mrs. Stanley. Yes. And that he's a homicidal maniac, and he'll turn up here and try to kill somebody? But why? Well, that's what I've got to find out from you. As the superintendent sees it, there must be some connection. Now, you state, sir, that you yourself have never had any connection with the Longridge Farm case. No. And the same goes for you, madam? I... I mean, no. No connection. What about servants? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't got any service. <laughs> and that reminds me. Would you mind, Sergeant Trotter, if I went to the kitchen? I'll be there if you want me. That's quite all right, Mrs. Ralston. Now then, can I have all your names, please? This is quite ridiculous. We are all here, staying in a kind hotel. We only just arrived yesterday. We had nothing to do with this. But you plan to come here in advance, though. You booked your rooms here ahead. Well, yes, certainly. <coughs> Everyone except, except Mr. Paravicini. <laughs> My car overturned in a snow drift. I see. What I'm getting at is that anyone who's been following you around might know very well that you were coming here. Now, there's just one thing I want to know, and I want to know it quick. Which one of you is it that has some connection with that business at Long Ridge Farm? <coughs> You're not being very sensible, you know. One of you is in danger, deadly danger. 
I've got to know which one that is. All right, I'll ask you one by one. You first, since you seem to have arrived here more or less by accident, Mr. Perry. Father, father of a genius. But, my dear inspector, I know nothing but nothing of what you are talking about. I am a stranger in this country. I know nothing of these local affairs of bygone years. Mrs. Boyle, I don't see. I mean, I really consider this quite an impertinent. Why on earth would I have anything to do with this, this distressing, this distressing behavior? Miss? Casewell. Leslie Casewell. I have never heard of Longwood Farm, and I know nothing about it. You, sir. Metcalf. Major. I read about the case at the time in the papers. I was stationed at Edinburgh then. No personal knowledge. And you? Christopher Wren. I was a mere child at the time. I don't even remember hearing about it. And that's all you have to say. Any of you? Well, if one of you gets murdered, you will have yourself to blame. <laughs> <laughs> now then, Mr. Rolston, can I have a look around the house? My dears, how melodramatic. He's very attractive, isn't he? I've always found the police very attractive. So stern and hard-boiled. What a thrill of the whole business. Three blind mice. How does that tune go? Really, mm -hmm. Mr. Wren. Oh, don't you like it? But it's a signature tune. The signature tune of the murderer. Just fancy what a kick he must be getting out of all this. <laughs> Not. I don't believe a word of it. Oh, really, Miss Boyle? Just wait until I creep up behind you. And you feel my hands around you! Oh. Oh. That'll do, Christopher! Oh. It's a poor excuse for a joke. In fact, it's not a joke at all. Oh, but that's where you're wrong! That's exactly what it is! <laughs> that's exactly what it is! A madman's joke! That's just what makes it so deliciously macabre! <laughs> if you can just see your faces! <laughs> Disgusting. He must 
must be quite old. And yet he skips about as though he were much younger. You'll be wanting more wood. I will get it. It's almost dark. It's only four o'clock in the afternoon. I'll turn the lights on. I wonder where I left my pen. talking about. Nothing from the past is going to affect me, except in the way I want it to. Well, everything's all right upstairs. Superintendent Hogben. But you can't telephone. The lines are down. What? Since when? Major Metcalf tried it just after you arrived. But it was all right earlier. Superintendent Hogben got through all right, yes? Yes, I, I suppose since then the, the lines are down with the snow. I wonder. It may have been cut. Cut? But who could have cut it? Mr. Ralston. Just how much do you know about the people who are staying in your guest house? Why, I, we, well, uh, we don't really know that much about them. Ah. Uh, but uh, Mrs. Boyle uh, wrote from the Bournemouth Hotel, and uh, Metcalf wrote from that address, where was that? From Flemington. And Wren wrote from Hampstead, mm -hmm. and the case well went from a private hotel in Kensington. Uh, Palavicini, as we've told you before, arrived out of the blue last night. 
Still, I suppose they have ration books, that sort of thing? Well, I shall go into all that, of course, but there's not much reliance to be placed on that sort of evidence. But even if this crazy killer were trying to get here and kill us all, or one of us, we're quite safe now because of the snow. No one can get here till it melts. Unless he's here already. Here already? Why not, Mr. Rolston? All these people arrived here yesterday evening, some hours after the murder of Mrs. Stanning. Plenty of time <coughs> to get here. But except for Mr. Panavicini, they had all booked beforehand. Well, why not? These crimes were planned. But crimes? There's only been one crime in Culver Street. Why are you so sure there's going to be one That it will happen here, no. I hope to prevent <coughs> that. That it will be attempted here, yes. <laughs> this is, I can't believe it is too fantastic. It isn't fantastic, sir. It's just facts. You've got a, a description of what this man looked like in London. Medium height, indeterminate build, darkish overcoat, soft felt hat, face hidden by a muffler, spoke in a whisper. There are three darkish overcoats hanging in your hall now. One of them is yours, Mr. Rolston. There are three light felt hats. I still don't believe it. You see, it's this telephone wire that worries me. If it's been cut, then we... must go to the kitchen and get on with the vegetables. <laughs> Is there an extension? I, I beg pardon, did you say something? Yes, Mr. Ralston. I said, is there an extension? Uh, yes, upstairs in our room. Go and try it up there for me, will you?
Mrs. Rolston, try and think. Think! I can't think. My head's numb. Mrs. Boyle had only just been killed when you got to her. You came from the kitchen, yes? Are you sure you didn't see or hear anybody as you came along the hallway? No, I don't think so. Just the radio blaring out in here. I couldn't think who had turned it on so loud. I wouldn't have heard anything else, would I? That was clearly the murderer's idea. Or murderess. How could I have heard anything else? You might have done. If the murderer had heard you coming from the kitchen and left the hall that way, he might have slipped up the back stairs or into the dining room. I think, I'm not sure, but I heard a door creak and shut just as I came out of the kitchen. Which door? I don't know. Oh, think, Mrs. Ralston, try and think. Upstairs, downstairs, close at hand, right, left. I don't know, I tell you. I'm not even sure I put anything. But can't you stop bullying her? Can't you see she's all in? We are investigating a murder, Mr. Ralston. Up till now, nobody has taken this thing seriously. Mrs. Boyle didn't. She held out on me with information. You all held out on me. Well, Mrs. Boyle is dead. Unless we get to the bottom of this and quickly mind, there may be another death. Oh, no, nonsense. Why? Because there were three little blind mice. So there must be a death for each one. But there'd have to be a connection with another connection to this Longridge farm business. Why, yes, there would have to be that. So why another here? Because there were only two addresses in that notebook we found. Now at 24 Culver Street, there was only the one possible victim, and she is dead. Here at Monkswell Manor, <laughs> there is a wider field. Nonsense. Surely, it would be a most unlikely coincidence that there should be two people brought here by chance, both with a connection in the Longridge Farm case. Given certain circumstances, it wouldn't be so much of a coincidence. Think it out, Miss Casewell. Now, I want to get down quite clearly where everyone was when Mrs. Boyle was killed. I've already got Mrs. Ralston's statement. You were in the kitchen, preparing vegetables. You came out of the kitchen, along the passage, through the swing door, into the hall, and in here. The radio was blaring, but the light was switched off, and the hall was dark. You switched the light on, saw Mrs. Boyle, and screamed. Yes, yes, I screamed and screamed, and at last people came. Yes, yes, as you say, people came, a lot of people from different directions, all arriving more or less at once. Now, when I went outside to trace the telephone wire, you, Mr. Ralston, went upstairs to the room that you and Mrs. Ralston occupied to try the extension telephone. Where were you when Mrs. Ralston screamed? Well, I was still upstairs. The extension telephone was dead, too. I just opened the window to see if I could determine where the line may have been cut. But I could not. I just closed the window when I heard Molly scream and I rushed out. Those simple actions took you rather a long time, didn't they, Mr. Rawson? <laughs> I don't think so. Yes, I should say you definitely took your time over them. I was thinking of something. Very well. Now then, Mr. Wren, I'll have your account of where you were. I was, I was in the kitchen with uh, Mrs. Ralston, uh, seeing if, anything, if there was anything I could do to help. Uh, I do it all cooking. After that, I, I went up to my bedroom. Why? I mean, it's quite a natural thing for one to do. I mean, one does want to be alone sometimes. <laughs> you went to your bedroom because you wanted to be alone. And then I wanted to uh, brush my hair and uh, tidy up. <laughs> you wanted to brush your hair. <laughs> Anyways, that's where I was. And then you heard Mrs. Ralston scream. Yes. And you came down. Yes. Hmm. Curious you and Mr. Ralston didn't meet on the stairs. Uh, I, I came down by the back stairs, but closer to my room. Did you go to your room by the back stairs, or did you go through there? I, I went by the back stairs, too. I see. Mr. Pedavicini. 
I told you, Inspector, I was playing piano in the drawing room through there. I am not an inspector, sir, just a sergeant. Did anybody hear you playing the piano? <laughs> I don't think a saw is playing very, very softly with a one finger. <laughs> <laughs> you were playing three blind mice. Is that so? Well, yes, it's a catchy little tune. It's a, how shall I say, a haunting little tune. Don't you want to play? I think it's horrible. And yet, it runs in people's heads. Somebody was whistling it, too. Whistling it? Where? I'm not sure. Perhaps in the front hall, perhaps on the stairs, perhaps even upstairs in a better room. Who was whistling three blind mice? Are you making this up, Mr. Perugini? No, no, inspe I beg your pardon, Sir Jean. I would not do a thing like that, no. Well, go on. You were playing the piano. I was playing with one finger. <laughs> <laughs> then I hear the radio playing a very loud. Somebody was shouting on it. It offended my ears. And then suddenly I hear Mrs. Ralston scream. Mr. Ralston upstairs. Mr. Wren <coughs> upstairs, Mr. Penavicini in the drawing room, Miss Casewell. I was writing letters in the library. Could you hear what was going on in here? No, I didn't hear anything until Mrs. Ralston screamed. And what did you do then? I came in here. At once? I think so. Hmm. You say you were writing letters in the library when you heard Mrs. Ralston scream? Yes. And got up from the writing table hurriedly and came in here? Yes. And yet there doesn't seem to be any unfinished letter on the writing desk in the library. I brought it with me. Dearest Jessie, hmm, friend of yours or relation? That is none of your damned business. Perhaps not. But you know, if I were to hear someone screaming blue murder when I was writing a letter, oh, I don't believe I'd take the time to pick up my unfinished letter, fold it, and put it in my pocket before going to see what was the matter. You wouldn't? How interesting. <laughs> <laughs> now then, Major Metcalf, what about you? You say you were in the cellar? Why? Looking around. I was just looking around. I looked into that cellar space under the stairs near the kitchen. <laughs> a lot of junk in sports tackle, if I recall. <laughs> and I noticed there was another door inside it, and I opened it and saw a flight of steps. I was curious, and I went down. Nice cellars you've got. <laughs> Glad you like them. <laughs> Not at all. Crypt of an old monastery, I should say. Probably why they call this place monks. Well, we are not engaged in antiquarian research, Major Metcalf. We're investigating a murder. Mrs. Ralston has told us that she heard a door shut with a faint creak. That particular door shuts with a creak. It could be, you know, that after killing Mrs. Boyle, the murderer heard Mrs. Ralston coming from the kitchen and slipped into the cupboard, pulling the door to after him. A lot of things could be. Hmm. There would be fingerprints inside the cupboard. Mine are there all right. But most criminals are careful to wear gloves, aren't they? Well, it's usual. But all criminals slip up sooner or later. Mm, I wonder, Sir Jean, if that's uh, really true. Look here, Sergeant. There are really only one person here. Please, Mr. Ralston, I am in charge of this investigation. Really, very well. Thank you. Now, we've got to establish opportunity, you know, as well as motive. Now, let me tell you all this. You all had opportunity. There are two staircases here. Anyone could go up by one and come down by the other. Anyone could go down to the cellars by the door near the kitchen and come up by a flight of steps that leads up to the trap door to the foot of the stairs over there. Now, the vital fact was that every one of you was alone at the time the murder was committed. Look here, Sergeant. You're speaking as though we were all under suspicion. 
That's absurd. In a murder case, everyone is under suspicion. But you pretty well know who committed the murder on Culver Street. You believe it is the eldest child of those children from the farm. A mentally abnormal 22-year-old <laughs> girl. But then I told so It's not true! It's not true! You're all against me! Everyone's always Come against now. me! No, don't defray me for murder! It's persecution! That's exactly what it is! It's persecution! Steady, lad! Steady! steady. Right, Chris. No one's against you. Uh, tell him it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't frame people. Uh, tell him you're not going to arrest him. I'm not arresting anybody. To do that, I've got to have evidence. I haven't got any evidence yet. Morgan, you're crazy. So are you. I tell you, there is only one person here who fits that bill, and if only as a safety measure, he ought to be placed under arrest. It is only fair to the rest of us. No, wait, wait, child. Sergeant Trotter, can I speak to you a minute? Well, certainly, Mrs. Ralston. Uh, Will the rest of you go into the dining room, please? I'm staying. No, Giles. I <coughs> am staying. What we want us to you to do, please. Please. <coughs> Sit down, Mrs. Ralston. What is it you want to say to me? Sergeant Trotter, you think that this crazy killer must be the eldest of those boys at the farm. But you don't know that, do you? Actually, we don't know a thing. All we've got so far is that the woman who joined with her husband in ill-treating and starving those children <coughs> has been killed, <coughs> and that the woman magistrate responsible for placing them there has been killed. <laughs> the telephone wire that links me with police headquarters has been cut. You don't even know that. It, it may have just gone down with the snow. No, Mrs. Ralston, the line was deliberately cut. It was cut just outside by the front door. I found the place earlier. Oh, I see. But all the same, you don't know. I'm you. going by probability. It all points the one way. Mental instability, childish mentality, desertion from the army, and the psychiatrist's report. Oh, I know. And therefore, it all seems to point to Christopher. But I don't believe it is, Christopher. There must be other possibilities. Such as? Well, hadn't those children any relations at all? The mother was a drunk. She died soon after the children were taken away from her. <clears throat> what about the father? He was an army sergeant serving abroad. If he's alive, he's probably discharged from the army by now. You don't know where he is now. We have no information. To trace him may take some time, but I can assure you, Mrs. Ralston, the police take every eventuality into account. But you don't know where he is at this minute. If the son was mentally unstable, the father may have been unstable too. Well, it's a possibility. If he came home, after being a prisoner of war perhaps, if he came home after suffering terribly and, and found that his wife had died and that his children had gone through some horrible experience and one of them had died through it, well, he might go off his head a bit and want revenge. Oh, that's only surmise. Yes, but it is possible. Yes, Mrs. Ralston. It's quite possible. So the... The murderer could be middle-aged, or even old. When I said the police had rung up, 
Major Metcalf was frightfully upset. He really was. I saw his face. Major Metcalf. <laughs> A soldier. Middle aged. I know he seems perfectly nice and, and normal and everything, but it mightn't really show, might it? No. Often it doesn't show at all. So, it's not only Christopher who's a suspect. There's Major Metcalf as well. Any other suggestions? <laughs> well, Mr. Peravicini did drop the poker when I said the police had rung up. Mr. Peravicini. <laughs> no, he, he seems quite old and, and foreign and everything. Yeah. But he might be really as old as he looks. He walks like a much younger man. Oh, and he's definitely got makeup on his face. Miss Casewell noticed it too. He might be, I know this sounds very melodramatic, but he might be disguised. You're very anxious, aren't you? <coughs> but it shouldn't be young Mr. Wren. It just seems so helpless. I'm very sad. Mrs. Ralston. Let me tell you something. I've had all of the possibilities in my mind ever since the very beginning. The boy Georgie, the father, and someone else. There was a sister, you remember. Oh, the sister? It might have been a woman who killed Maureen Lyon. A woman. The muffler pulled up, man's felt hat pulled well down, and the killer whispered, you know, it's the voice that gives the sex away. <laughs> yes, it might have been a woman. Miss Casewell? She looks a bit old for the part, but yes, Mrs. Ralston. There is a very wide field. There's yourself, for instance. Me? You're about the right age. What time? No, no, no. Whatever you tell me about yourself, I've got no means of checking it at this moment, remember? And then, and then there's your husband. Giles? <coughs> How ridiculous. Well, he and Christopher Wren are much of an age. Say your husband looks older than his years, and Christopher Wren looks younger. Actual age is very hard to tell. How much do you know about your husband, Mrs. Ralston? How much do I know about Giles? It's absolutely silly. Well, you've been married how long? We've been married a year. And you met him where? At a dance in London. We went in a party. Did you meet his people? He hasn't got any people. They're all dead. They're all dead? <laughs> Yes, oh, but you made it all sound wrong. <laughs> his father was a barrister and his mother died when he was a baby. You're only telling me what he told you. <coughs> well, yes, but you don't know it of your own knowledge. Oh, it's outrageous oh, that you... Oh, you'd be surprised, Mrs. Ralston, if you knew how many cases rather like yours we get. Especially since the war. Homes broken up. <coughs> Families dead. Fellow says he's been in the Air Force or just finished his army training. Parents killed, no relations. There aren't any backgrounds nowadays. And young people settle their own affairs. Well, they meet and they marry. It's parents and relatives who used to make the inquiries before they consented to an engagement. But that's all done away with. Girl just marries her man. Sometimes she doesn't find out for a year or two that he's an absconding bank clerk <coughs> or an army deserter or something equally undesirable. How long had you known Giles Ralston when you married him? <coughs> Just three weeks, but he was... And you don't know anything about <coughs> Well, that's not true. I know everything about him. I know exactly what sort of person he is. He's Giles. <laughs> and it's absolutely absurd to suggest that he's some horrible, crazy, homicidal maniac. But Giles wasn't even in London yesterday when the
the murder took place. Where was he? Here? He went across country to a sale to get some wire netting for our chickens. Bring it back with him. No, it was the wrong kind. It's only 30 miles out of London, aren't you? Oh, you've got an ABC. Only an hour by train, a little longer I by I tell car. you that Giles wasn't in London yesterday! Just a minute, Mrs. Walston. of London about 3.30 yesterday afternoon. I don't believe it. Don't you? Stick it out? 
Well, frankly, what else can you do? I might pick up the sergeant's skis. I can ski quite well. <laughs> that would be frightfully stupid. It would be almost like admitting you're guilty. The sergeant thinks I'm guilty. No, he doesn't. <coughs> At least, I don't know that he thinks. I hate him. I hate him, I hate him. Who? Sergeant Trotter. He puts things in your head. Things that aren't true. Things that can possibly be true. What is all this? I don't believe it. I won't believe it. What won't you believe? Come on, out with it. You see that? Yes. What is it? A London paper. Yesterday's paper. And it was in Giles' coat pocket. But Giles wasn't in London yesterday. Well, if Giles was here all day... But he wasn't. He went off in the car to get some wire netting for the chickens. But he didn't find any. Well, that's all right. Giles probably did go up to London after all. But then why shouldn't he tell me he did? Why tell me he was off driving around the countryside? <coughs> Perhaps with this news of this murder... If Giles didn't know about the murder. <coughs> Or did he? Did he? Good Lord, Molly. Surely you don't think that the sergeant thinks No, that I don't know what the sergeant thinks. I can make you think things about people. You start asking yourself questions. And, and then you begin to doubt. And you feel that somebody you love and know well might be a stranger. Oh, that's what happens in a nightmare. You're somewhere in the middle of friends, and then you suddenly look at their faces. And they're not your friends any longer. They're different people, <coughs> just pretending. Perhaps you can't trust anybody. Perhaps everybody's a stranger. <gasps> I seem to be interrupting something. <coughs> no, we were. You were just talking. I um, must go to the kitchen. There's the pie and the potato. Oh, 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 come and give you a hand. No, 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 no. Potato tails are not very healthy things at present. You keep out of the kitchen and keep away from my wife. Giles. But really, look. Keep away from my wife, Ren. She is not going to be the next victim. So that's what you think of me. That's just what I said, didn't I? There is a murderer loose in this house. It seems to me that you fit the bill. I'm not the only one who fits the bill. I don't see who else does. How blind you are, or do you just pretend to be blind? <laughs> I tell you, I am concerned for my wife's safety. And so am I. I'm not going to leave her alone here with you. What the hell do you think please, you're going to do? Please, 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 go. please, 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 going on here? Molly, you must be crazy. You were perfectly prepared to lock yourself away in the kitchen with a homicidal maniac. He isn't. What only have to look at him to see he's balmy? He isn't. He's just unhappy. I tell you, Giles, he isn't dangerous. I'd know if he was dangerous. And anyway, I can take care of myself. That is what Mrs. Boyle said. Just don't. What is it between you and that wretched boy? What do you mean between us? I'm sorry for him, that's all. Perhaps you've met before. Perhaps you suggested for him to come here, and you both would pretend that you were meeting for the very first time. You told this up between you, didn't you? Have you gone out of your mind, Giles? How dare you suggest such things? It's rather odd, don't you think? That he should choose to come and stay at an out-of-the-way place such as this. No odder than Major Metcalf or Miss Casewell or Mrs. Boyle should. I read a paper once that these homicidal cases are able to attract women. <coughs> it appeared that was so. 
When did you first meet him? How long has this been going on? You're being absolutely ridiculous. I never laid eyes on Christopher Wren until yesterday. That's what you say. Perhaps you've been trekking up to London to meet him on the sly. You know perfectly well that I haven't been to London for weeks. You haven't been up to London for weeks? Is that so? What do you mean? It's quite true. Is it? And what is this? Does one of the gloves you were wearing yesterday? You dropped it. I picked it up when I was speaking with Sergeant Trotter this afternoon. And look what I found inside. A London bus ticket. Oh, that. <laughs> so not only did you go to the village yesterday, but you went to London as well. All right, I went to London. I was safely up, racing around the countryside. Whilst you were racing around the country. Come on, admit it, you went to London. All right, I went to London. But so did you. What? <laughs> so did you. You brought back an evening paper. Where did you get this? It was in your overcoat pocket. Anyone could have put that there? <laughs> did they? Oh, no. You were in London. Well, yes, I went to London, but I didn't go there to meet a woman. Didn't you? Are you sure and you didn't? What do you mean? Go away and don't come near me. What are you saying? Don't touch me. Did you go to London yesterday to meet Christopher Ray? Don't be a fool. Of course I didn't. Then why did you go? I... I shan't tell you that. <laughs> Perhaps now I've forgotten why I went. Molly, well, what is happening here? It's as if I, you've changed somehow. It's like I didn't know you anymore. <coughs> well, perhaps you never did know me. We've been married how long? A year? But you really don't know anything about me. What I've done, or thought, or felt, or suffered before you knew me? Molly, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right then, I'm crazy. Why not? Perhaps it's fun to be crazy. Molly, what in the hell is going on here? I'm no, dead. no, oh, I God don't say you young people <laughs> are not both saying a little more than you mean. Uh, one is so apt to in these uh, lovers' quarrels. Lovers' quarrels, that's good. <laughs> oh, quite so, quite so. I've been through it all myself when I was a younger man. Jeunesse, jeunesse, as the poet says. Not been married long, I imagine. There's no business of yours, Palavatrini. No, no, no business at all. But I just came to say that the sergeant cannot find his skis, and I'm afraid he's very annoyed. Christopher. What's that? He wants to know if you have moved them, Mr. Ralston. Certainly not. Mr. Ralston? Mrs. Ralston? Have you removed my skis from the cupboard near the kitchen door? Of course not. Somebody has taken them. And what made you happen to look for them? <laughs> the snow is still lying, Mr. Pervicini. <laughs> I need help here. Reinforcements. I was going to ski over to the police station at Market Hampton to report on the situation. And now you can't. Oh, dear, dear, somebody <laughs> see to it that you certainly shan't do that. But there could be another reason, couldn't there? Yes, what? Well, somebody may want it to get away. <laughs> Why did you say Christopher just then? Nothing. So, our young architect is hooked it, has he? Very, very interesting. Is this true, Mrs. Ralston? <laughs> Thank goodness you haven't gone. Have you taken my skis, Mr. Wren? Your skis, Sergeant? No, why should I? Mrs. Ralston seemed to well, think then that... I just know that Mr. Wren likes to ski, and I thought maybe he'd taken them to get a little exercise. Exercise? Now listen, you people! This is a serious matter! Somebody has removed my only chance of communication with the outside world. <coughs> I want everybody here at once. 
I think of Mr. K. Sewell on was upstairs. I'll get her. And I left a Major Metcalf in the dining room. Uh, Major Metcalf! Oh, oh, he's not there now. <laughs> <laughs>
Just touch with a soupçon of moutard. Come with me to the kitchen and we shall make a charming concoction together. I will assist my wife. <laughs> Your husband is afraid for you, quite a natural under the circumstances. He doesn't fancy you being alone with me. It is uh, my sadistic tendencies he fears, not my dishonorable ones. Alas, uh, what an inconvenience the husband always is. <laughs> I am sure that Giles doesn't think that you have He's a very wise. I take no chances. But can I prove to you, or to him, or to our dog with Sergeant, that I am not a homicidal maniac, so difficult to prove a negative. But suppose I am really. Mm, mm, mm. Don't. <laughs> but such a gay little tune, don't you think? She cut off their tails with a carving knife. Sneak, sneak, sneak. <laughs> Delicious. Just what a child would adore. Cruel little things, children. Some of them. Never grow up. Uh, stop scaring my wife, Madame Chini. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> it's silly of me. you say to the lady to upset her, sir? No, me, Sergeant? Oh, just um, a little innocent fun. I've always been a fond of a little joke. Mm. <laughs> well, there's nice fun, and there's fun that's not so nice. Mm. What exactly do you mean by that, Sergeant? Well, I mean that I've been doing a little wondering <clears throat> about you, sir. Indeed? Yes, indeed. I've been wondering about that car of yours, how it happened to overturn in a snowdrift so conveniently. Inconveniently, uh, you mean, don't you, Sergeant? Well, that rather depends on the way you're looking at it. Just where were you bound for, by the way, when you had this accident? Oh, I was on the way to see a friend. In this neighborhood? Not so very far from here. And what was the name and address of this friend? I didn't say. No. <laughs> you didn't say. <laughs> and it seems you're not going to say. Now that's very interesting. Oh, but there could be so many reasons and no more discretion. These are jealous husbands. Rather <laughs> old to be running around with the ladies at your time of life, aren't you? I am uh, perhaps not quite as old as I look, Sir Jean. That's exactly what I was thinking, sir. What? That you're not as old as you try to look. There's a lot of people trying to go about looking younger than they are. Oh, if somebody goes about trying to look uh, older, it does make one ask oneself, why? Really, Sir Jean? Having asked questions of so many people, you ask questions of yourself as well. Isn't that overdoing things? <laughs> well, I might get an answer for myself. <laughs> I don't get many from you. Well, well, ask again. That is, if you have any more questions. <laughs> One or two. Just where were you coming from last night? No, really. Does that matter, Sergeant Trotter? I mean, it has nothing to do with this predicament, has it? I think it might. Where precisely were you coming from last night? I always said the Ritz Hotel. Oh, the Ritz. So London, eh? What is your permanent address? I just like a permanency. <laughs> <laughs> what is your business or profession? I play the market. 
Stockbroker? No. No, you misunderstand of me. Enjoying this little game, aren't you? <laughs> sure of yourself, too. Hmm. But I shouldn't be too sure. No. You're mixed up in a murder case, and don't you forget it. Murder isn't just fun and games. <laughs> Not even this murder. Dear me, Sergeant Trotter, you're very serious. But then, uh, policemen never know a sense of humor. Is the Inquisition over for the moment? <laughs> for the moment, yes. Thank you so much. Then I shall return to the drawing room and look for your skis, just in case somebody has hidden them in the grand piano. <laughs> Just a minute, please. Were you speaking to me? <coughs> yes. Perhaps you'd come and sit down. Well, what do you want? You may have heard some of the questions I was asking uh, Mr. Perevicini. I heard them. Yes, I'd like to have a little information from you. What do you want to know? Full name, please. Leslie? Margaret, Catherine Casewell. Catherine? Well, I spelled it with a K. Quite so. Address? Villa Mariposa, Pan Dior, Mallorca. That's in Italy? No, it's Spanish. It's an island. It's a Spanish island. <coughs> and your address in England? Kerr Morgan's Bank, Leading Hall Street. No other English address? No. And how long have you been in England? A week. And you have been staying since your arrival? At the Ledbury Hotel, Knightsbridge. Hmm. What brought you to Monkswell Manor, Miss Casewell? I wanted somewhere quiet, in the country. And how long did you, or, or do you, Propose to remain here. Until I finish what I came to do. And what was that? And what was that? Huh? What was it that you came here to do? I beg your pardon, I was thinking of something else. You haven't answered my question. I don't really see why I should, you know. It's a strictly private affair. A matter that concerns me alone. All the same, Miss Case. No! Well. I don't think we'll argue about it. Would you mind telling me your age? Not in the least. It's on my passport. I'm 24. 24? You are thinking I look older. That is quite true. Is there anyone in the country that can vouch for you? My bank will <coughs> reassure you to my financial position. I can also refer you to a solicitor, a very discreet man. I am not in a position to offer you a social reference. I have lived most of my life abroad. In Mallorca. In Mallorca and other places. Were you born abroad? No. I left England when I was 13. You know, Miss Casewell. I can't quite make you out. Does it matter? I don't know. It seems to worry you. It does worry me. You say you went abroad when you were 13? 12, 13 thereabouts. Was your name Casewell then? It's my name now. What was your name then? Come on, tell me. What are you trying to prove? I want to know what your name was when you left England. It's a long time ago, I've forgotten. There are things one doesn't forget. Possibly. Unhappiness, despair. I dare say. What's your real name? I told you. Catherine, what the hell are you doing here? Oh, God, I wish to God I never came here. I always thought the police weren't allowed to get the third degree. <laughs> I have merely been interrogating this case, well. You seem to have said it. What did he do? No, no, it's nothing. It's just all this murder. It came over me suddenly. I'll go up to my room. I can't believe it. It's impossible. 
impossible. Uh, what's impossible? Six impossible things before breakfast, like the Red Queen. <laughs> yes, it's rather like that. My dear, it looks like you've seen a ghost. I've seen something I ought to have seen before. Blind as a bat I have been. But I think now we may be able to get somewhere. The police have a clue? Yes, Mr. Wren, at last, the police have a clue. I want everyone assembled in here again. Do you know where they are? Giles and Molly are, are in the kitchen. Major Metcalf and I were looking for your scheme. We looked in most entertaining of places. But to no avail. I don't know what pair the she is. Well, I'll get him. You get the others. Mr. Paravicini. <coughs> Mr. Paravicini. <coughs> Paravicini! Oh, yes, the sergeant. What can I do for you? <laughs> dear, dear, little Bob policeman has lost his skis and doesn't know where to find them. Leave them alone and they'll come home, dragging a murderer behind them. <laughs> what is all this? Oh, sit down, Major. Uh, Mrs. Walston. Must I come now? It's very inconvenient. There are more important things than meals, Mrs. Walston. Mrs. Boyle, for instance, won't want another meal. That's a very tactless way of putting things, Sergeant. I'm sorry, but I want cooperation. And I intend to get it. <coughs> Mr. Ralston, would you go up and ask Miss Casewell to come down again? She went up in her room, I believe. Tell her it will only be for a few minutes. <laughs> Have your schemes been found, Sergeant? No. But I may say I have a very shrewd suspicion of who took them, and of why they were taken, but I won't say any more at the present moment. Oh, please don't. I always think explanations should be saved to the very end. The exciting last chapter, you know. This is not a game, sir. Oh, but I think that's where you're wrong. A game to somebody. You think the murderer's enjoying himself? Maybe. Maybe. What is happening? Sit down, Miss Casewell. Mrs. Ralston, would you all pay attention, please? <clears throat> you may remember that after the murder of Mrs. Boyle, I took statements from you all. Those statements related to your positions at the time that the murder was committed. Those statements were as follows. Uh, Mrs. Ralston in the kitchen, Mr. Pedavicini playing the piano, in the drawing room, Mr. Ralston up in his bedroom, Mr. Wren, ditto, Miss Casewell in the library, and Major Metcalf in the cellar. Correct. Those were the statements you made. Now, I've had no <coughs> means of checking these statements. They may be true, they may not be. Well, to put it quite clearly, five of these statements are true. But one is false. Which one, eh? Five of you were speaking the truth. But one of you was lying. I have a plan that may help me to discover the liar. And if I discover that one of you was lying to me, then I know who the murderer is. Not necessarily. Someone may have lied for some other reason. I rather doubt. That. What's the idea? You just said you had no way of verifying anything in all statements. No, but supposing everyone was to go through these actions a second time. Oh, that old just not the, the reconstruction of a crime. That's a foreign idea. <laughs> not a reconstruction of the crime, Mr. Perevicini. A reconstruction of the movements of apparently innocent persons. And what do you expect to learn from that? You will forgive me, sir, if I don't make that clear. Just at the moment. So you want to repeat performance? Yes, Mr. Ralston, I do. Hmm. It's a trap. <coughs> what do you mean, it's a trap? It's a trap, I know it is. I only want people to do exactly what they did before. Uh, but uh, I, I don't understand. What, what do you hope to find out by just making people do the same thing over again? I think it's nonsense. <coughs> do you, Mr. Wren? Well, you can count me out. I'm too busy in the kitchen. I can't count anybody out, Mrs. Ralston. 
One might almost believe that you all are guilty from the looks of you. Why are you all so unwilling? No, Sergeant, Sergeant, uh, we will cooperate. We will all enact this, yes? Hey, Molly? Very well. Wren? Miss Casewell? Yes. Hannah Vaccini? All right, I consent. <laughs> Major? Yes. So we are to do exactly as we did before? The same actions will be performed, yes. Then I shall return to the drawing room and pick out with one finger. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite so fast, Mr. Pervicini. Um, hmm. Do you play the piano, Mrs. Rolston? Yes, I do. And you know the tune of Three Blind Mice? Don't we all know it? Then you could pick it out with one finger on the piano, <laughs> just as Mr. Pervicini did. Good. Please go into the drawing room, sit at the piano, and be ready to play when I give you the signal. But, Sergeant, I thought we were each to perform the same actions again. The same actions will be performed, but not necessarily by the same people. Thank you, Mrs. Rolston. I don't see the point. There is a point. It is a means of checking up on the original statements, and maybe one statement in particular. Now, will you all pay attention, please? I will assign each of you your new stations. Uh, Mr. Wren, would you kindly go to the kitchen? Just keep an eye on Mrs. Houston's dinner for her. You're very fond of cooking, I believe. Mr. Pedavicini, would you go up to Mr. Wren's bedroom? By the back stairs is the most convenient way. <laughs> Major Metcalf, would you go up to Mr. Ralston's bedroom and check the telephone there? Miss Casewell, would you mind going down to the cellars? Uh, Mr. Wren will show you the way. Unfortunately, I need someone to reproduce my own actions. Now, I am sorry to ask it of you, Mr. Ralston, but would you mind going outside to trace the telephone wire? <laughs> Rather a chilly job, I know, but, well, you're probably the toughest person here. And what are you going to do? I am enacting the part of Mrs. Boyle. Taking a bit of a risk now, aren't you? <laughs> you will all stay in your places and remain there until you hear me call you. Parlor games! No objection to my wearing a kit. <laughs> I should advise it, sir. Oh, sir, take my torch. It's behind the curtain on your way out. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Ralston, count to five and then begin to play. Extraordinarily foolish, you know. <coughs> You've run a very good chance of being killed by holding out on me. And as a result, you have been in serious danger more than once. I don't know what you mean. Oh, come now, Mrs. Ralston. You policemen aren't quite so dumb as you think. <laughs> All along, I realized that you had first hand knowledge of the Longridge Farm affair. 
You knew Mrs. Boyle was the magistrate concerned. In fact, you knew all about it. Why didn't you speak up and say so? I don't understand. I wanted to forget. Forget. Your maiden name was Waring. Yes. Miss Wary. You taught school. <coughs> in the school where those children went. Yes. It's true, isn't it? That Jimmy, the child who died, managed to get a letter posted to you. That letter begged for help. Help from his kind young teacher. And you never answered that letter. I couldn't. I never got it. You just didn't bother. That's not true. I was ill. I went down with pneumonia that very day. The letter was set aside with others. <clears throat> it was weeks before I found it with all the other letters. And by then, that poor child was dead. 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 Just waiting for me to do something. Hoping. Gradually losing hope. It's haunted me ever since. If only I had known. I hadn't been ill. Mm. <coughs> oh, it's monstrous that such things should happen. Yes. It's monstrous. I thought police didn't carry revolvers. The police don't! I'm not a policeman, Mrs. Ralston. You thought I was a policeman because I rang up from a coal box and said that I was calling from police headquarters and that Sergeant Trot was on his way. <laughs> I cut the telephone wires before I came through the front door. <clears throat> you know who I am, Mrs. Ralston. I'm Georgie. I'm Jimmy's brother, Georgie. <gasps> you better not scream, Mrs. Ralston, because if you do, I shall fire this revolver. I'd like to talk to you a little. I said I'd like to talk to you a little. Shh. Jimmy. <coughs> Jimmy died. That nasty, cruel woman killed him. And they put her in prison? Prison wasn't bad enough for her? I said. I said, I'll kill her one day. And I did too. In the fog. It was great fun. I hope Jimmy knows. I said, I'd kill them all when I grow up. That's what I said to myself. Because grown ups can do anything they like. I'm going to kill you in a minute. You better not. You'll never get away safely, you know. No, somebody's hidden my skis. I can't find them anywhere. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. No, no. I don't really mind if I get away or not. I'm tired. I'm tired. But it's all been such fun watching you all. <laughs> and pretending to be a policeman. That revolver will make a lot of noise. Huh. It will, rather. Hmm. Much better to do it the usual way and take you by the neck! <laughs> Quiet now, Miss Waring. The last little mouse in the trap. Georgie! Georgie, no! Oh, no! Georgie! You remember me, don't you? You remember the farm? The animals? The battled pig? The day the bulls chased us, and 
the dogs. Dogs? Yes. Spot and play. Kathy. Yes, Kathy. Kathy. You remember me now, don't you? Kathy. Yes, you. So what are you doing here? Well, I came to England to find you. I didn't recognize you until you twirled your hair the way you always did. Mm -hmm. Yes, you always did. Georgie, come with me. Yeah. You're coming with me. Where are we going? I'm going to take you somewhere safe. Well, they'll take care of you and ensure you'll do no more harm. Ralston! Ralston! Oh my God, Molly! Unconscious soon with the sedative. He's upstairs with his sister. Poor fellow is as mad as a hatter, of course. <laughs> I've had my suspicions of him all along. You did? You didn't believe he was a policeman? I knew he wasn't a policeman. You see, Mrs. Ralston, I'm a policeman. You? As soon as we got hold of that notebook with Montville Manor written in it, we saw it was vital to have someone on the spot. We asked Major Metcalf, and he allowed me to take his place. I didn't understand it when Trotter turned up. And Miss Casewell is his sister? Yes, and it seems she recognized him just before this last business. Didn't know what to do about it, but fortunately <coughs> came to me just in time. Well, it started to thaw. Help should be here pretty soon. Oh, thank God. Oh, I almost forgot. I'll remove those skis, Mrs. Ralston. I hid them on top of the four-post <laughs> <laughs> And I thought it was pair of the cheeky. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm thinking those be... <clears throat> examining his car rather closely. I shouldn't wonder if they find a thousand or so Swiss watches in the rear wheel. <laughs> yes, he is in that kind of business. A nasty bit of goods. <sighs> Darling, I do believe that you thought that I was... Charles, why were you in London yesterday? I was buying you an anniversary present. We have been married a year just today. That's what I went to London for. I didn't want you to know. No. <clears throat> they're cigars. I hope they're all right. Oh, darling, they're splendid. You will smoke them. Oh, I will smoke them. <laughs> <laughs> and what is my present? Oh, yes, I almost forgot about your present. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. oh, my pie! Oh, oh, oh. 